speak to you after 30 minutes, huh? You, know? <laughs> you guys doing all right? Uh, I was, I was just a second. My, I'm Steve. I'm the lead pastor here. Uh, so I took, I was off my normal time in July, come back one week, and then I missed again last week, although I was on tape delay in case you were here. And if you're curious as to why I was gone, my, my daughter decided to give us grandkid number two. Are we ready for that? Yeah, that's that there. So I had a choice. I could either be with you or I could be with her and stay married to my wife so she gets your grandbaby and they won. And so, anyway, I, I promise I'm going to start being a regular attender now. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, we're, we're, doing our, we're continuing our series called Living on a Prayer. We're talking about prayer and that. And if you want to go ahead, we're going to end up in Matthew chapter 6. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bible or turn on your Bible to Matthew chapter 6, that's where we're going to end up at. And one of the ch- things about talking about prayer is we've got a very diverse group. We've got a very diver- diverse room here. And if I were able to pull each of you into maybe a group of two or three people where you could be really, really honest, not church honest, but real honest, you know the difference, right? Church honest is what you tell church people when they ask you something. Okay, when, if we get from church honest to real honest, then we could all get everybody in small enough groups where you could be real honest. And I, and I would get you talking about prayer. We get a real diverse bunch of answers. I mean, we get some people, and very honestly, they would be able to say that prayer is, is a crucial part of my life, that I, I love to pray, that I pray on a, on a pretty much a daily basis, that, I, that I'm in fellowship with God, and it's, it's a great, great, important part of my life. And then we'd have people here, because of the diversity in the room, we'd have people here who are still struggling with, does God exist to talk to? And so you'd, you'd be going, some of you'd be going, well, I like the concept of prayer, but I'm not really committed to it. And then we'd have in the middle just about everything. And I think, though, if you're going to draw it on a, like a, a, a chart, you'd have a, a, you know, a bell graph where most of the people are kind of in the middle. I think an awful lot of the people in the room would end up, once we discussed it and sort of classified it, would end up as what I'm calling guilt prayers. Not, not that you're guilty about Yeah, you're guilty about it. Because you know you're supposed to pray. You understand intellectually you're supposed to pray a lot. You understand you think it's supposed to be a crucial part of your spiritual life and journey. But when you come down to it, you're just a little bit guilty about how you do it and how you feel about it and whether or not you're doing it well enough or often enough is am I living into what I'm supposed to be doing as a Christian because they say Christianity that prayer is really important and I understand that and I even agree with that but I'm not sure I'm doing it right. I'm not sure I'm doing it well enough. If, you know, as school starts, if they were giving out grades for my prayer life, honestly, I'm kind of uncomfortable with the whole concept of prayer life because it's just something, it's not part of my, does that make sense? I'm kind of in the, the guilt prayer zone. I pray because I'm supposed to most of the time. Does that make sense? And I think there's an awful lot of us who are in that zone where we know prayer's supposed to be important and we know we're supposed to do it. But the follow through and the really understanding it and feeling like it's, it's just not always there. Does that make sense? Am I talking to anybody in the room or is everybody, or are all of you over here on the, I just, my prayer time is the greatest part of my day every day, and I look forward to it completely, and I always walk away completely satisfied, and God always answers my prayers, and God, and it's just an amazing thing. Is everybody over here, or everybody, or a lot of you here in this middle section? Okay. Now, one of the reasons that I would put myself a lot of times in that guilt section is because there's a paradox that comes with prayer. I mean, it makes sense, but there's something about it that, that, that it's like a conflict in me, a contrast. And it comes from, the, the Bible's really, really clear that I'm supposed to pray a lot, right? I mean, like, like, like Jesus is talking in uh, Luke 18, and he says one day Jesus told his disciples a story to, to show they should always pray and never give up. 
And then Jesus tells the story about this widow who needs something from a judge, and she goes back to the judge over and 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 nags the daylights out of him until he gives her what she wants. And then Jesus said, and, oh, by the way, you should pray like that. And then we run into Paul talking about, not Paul, but Luke talking about the, the early church. And he says that the very first church said they all joined together constantly in prayer. And then Paul is talking, Paul wrote a lot to the early churches to say, here's how you do church. And he says in Colossians, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And then he comes in to the church at Ephesus, and he says, pray in the Spirit at all times on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And then we come to the classic, and he's talking to the church in Thessalonica, and he says, pray without ceasing. Okay, so now I've got my guilt fully in hand. But then, to make it complicated, we come across something like we find in in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus is talking, and in in verse 7, he says, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Going, don't repeat your words again and again. Pray without ceasing. Should I like pray with a thesaurus? So I'm not using the same words over and over? Is that what he, what, what's, what's, and then he says the thing that, that just completely floors me. Don't be like them for your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. So don't repeat your words over and over and recognize that even before you pray, God knows exactly what you need. But I'm supposed to pray without ceasing. I'm supposed to pray regularly. I'm supposed to pray almost constantly. I'm supposed to pray passionately. To a God, well, listen, listen, this is Isaiah 46. God's talking. God says, only I can tell you the future before it even happens. I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. God does exactly what God wants to do, God knows the end from the beginning. He knows history from the... He knows exactly what you're going to pray. He knows what you're going to ask for. And he's already decided whether or not he's going to do it or not. So what's the point of me praying? Do you see the paradox here? I'm supposed to pray to an almighty, all-powerful God who knows absolutely everything so much better than I do. He knows the best response, the best result before I bring it up. And then he says, oh, pray a lot. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm missing something. Because if I've got an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-everything God who knows the absolute best course of action in every situation, he really doesn't need my advice on what he needs to do. He doesn't need a board of advisors. He doesn't need me saying, God, you should do this. And he says to do it anyway. So, if he already knows everything, and he already knows everything he's going to do, and he knows what I'm going to pray before I pray it, what's the point of prayer? Why am I being made to feel guilty about not talking enough to a God who already knows every step he's going to take. Good enough question for the day? Well, I got, there's two reasons the Bible tells us why we should anyway. The first is amazing, and the second... It, it is amazing, too. The first one, which it, it, I think this might be the more amazing, amazing one, is the Bible teaches really clearly that God listens to our prayers. That our prayers actually impact reality. I'm not talking that we, we say, and God bless, bless the, the orphans, and God whatever the word bless means, goes out and sprinkles blessing dust on people. I mean, we pray specific things, and our words move the hands of the Almighty God. 
Now stop and let that sink for just a second. The God who knows the end from the beginning, the God who knows absolutely everything, the all-powerful one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who said, let there be light, and there was light, listens to our requests and moves based on them. James 4.2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. The freaky thing. God does whatever he wishes. And what he wishes is to let our prayers impact reality. That's his desire. His desire is to change the world based on our prayers, to change the things around us, to change things ever based on our praying. Okay, that's, that's, um, that's a pretty good reason to pray. That there's a God who is listening. But there's something else. Something I think is just as cool. Because prayer is defined. We don't use this phrase a lot here. But I may start because I like the phrase. There are certain things that as Christians, as people who are followers of Jesus do, that get defined or described as disciplines. Now, what's a discipline? A discipline is when you do something because doing it and disciplining yourself to do it will cause improvement, right? Like, let's, let's say you want to lose X pounds. How do you do that, right? Well, you have to discipline yourself in certain areas to do and not do certain things, right? Like, if you decide you're going to lose weight, that means we're going to have to cut out banana splits for supper, Okay, that, that, that's, that's, that's going to have to go bye-bye. We're, you know, I, I know it's fruit and it's dairy. I don't see the problem. But if I'm going to change something in my life, I have to have a discipline that says, here are the actions I'm going to take in order to make this happen in my life, right? If I want to get in shape, then I'm going to start doing exercises. I'm going to do push-ups and pull-ups and sit up and, and jumping jacks and, 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 and not just do the one thumb Remote push, right? There are disciplines. Well, in Christianity, we have, both through what the Scripture records and just from, just from being followers of Christ, there are a number of activities that we've discovered and we call disciplines. These are the things that when you do them consistently over time, God uses them in your life to transform you to be more like Jesus. Okay? And what happens is, each of these things, you've heard, you know, like when I get up and I say, you should be reading your Bible. Why am I saying that? Because I get points if you read, you know, if enough, of my, if enough of my people read their Bible, I get special points and I get, you know, there's like a club and it's like a, you know, multi-level marketing thing. If I get enough of you reading the Bible, then I get special prizes and I get, you know, like a vacation trip and a, you know, and a special colored car. No. Do it because as you read your Bible, history shows us in the church as you exercise that discipline in your life, you will become more like Jesus. That will happen. Worship. Why do we get together once a week and do a, and do a worship time where there's music and where there's teaching? Because church history shows that as we gather together and worship together and learn together, that you grow and develop. Why do we push you to serve, to do things for God? Because it's shown that as you develop the discipline of selflessness, of serving others, that you grow as a follower of Christ. Why do we say giving? Because giving's a discipline. It teaches you, you grow as a follower of Christ. Prayer is universally considered to be a discipline. It is something that history shows, everybody's results show, as you discipline yourself to pray, not only does God change the reality around you, God changes you. Okay? Matter of fact, I would say that the greater reason to pray is not because God answers your prayers and changes your reality around you. It's because God answers your prayers and changes the reality within you. Listen to um, Jesus again in Matthew, right before we read before. He says, but when you pray, go away by yourself and shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. Did you know there's a 
prize at the bottom of the prayer cereal box? If you go to the box, this made me think of something. This is, this is just a side point. Did you ever notice that they always put prizes in the bottom of the cereal you'd eat anyway? I mean, Fruit Loops. You don't beg people to eat Fruit Loops. You don't need a prize. You need a prize at the bottom of the All Bran. <laughs> right? Twigs and branches cereals, the one that actually make you a healthier person. There should be a prize in that one. Okay, I'm just saying, that's just... Well, he says, prayer, there's a prize at the bottom. There is a reward at the bottom of the prayer box. If you eat your prayer cereal, something happens. You get rewarded. Well, what's the reward? Now, somebody say, oh, I bet God gives you cool stuff, like the trinkets at the bottom of the cereal thing. He might give you a cooler house or a neater car, all that cool stuff. And I'm going, here's the problem with that scenario. Has your kid ever gone out in the yard and brought you back, especially mothers get this, brought you back an amazing present because they found a flower? And it's, and, it's, and it's a weed, okay, let's be honest, it's a weed that has a blossom. And your child brings you, the, you know, three inches of a weed blossom. And you look at it and you're grateful because your child is thinking of you and you love the thing and it dies the second it touches your hand. Right? Because it's a weed blossom. And the moment it hits your hand, it's already... It's already shriveling, and it's, you can't get it to water, and there's no way to put it in something that will keep it alive for more than a couple seconds because it's a weed blossom. Okay, let's, let's, we have the eternal God of the universe who thinks in terms of millions of years, not millions of hours, and he's going to give you a car that's going to be dead in how long? And that's your prize? He's going to give you a house that's going to last how long? You ever driven down the road and seen a house that's just falling apart? Yes, you have. All houses end up there. That's where they go. And in God's time perspective, all of them are like weed blossoms. Everything that I can give you is a weed blossom. I don't think when Jesus says, and your Father will reward you, He's talking about weed blossoms. I think he's talking about something much more significant. Now, some will say, oh, he's giving you crowns in heaven. I'm not really sure how we define that concept, but he gives you rewards in heaven, and I think that's probably somewhat true. But, I think I've already alluded to this, we learn in, um, in the book of Romans that God's greatest desire for you is for you to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. In other words, God wants to make you like Christ. That's his big goal for your life. Asking what's, what, anybody in this room, what's God's biggest goal for your like, life? He wants to make you just like Jesus. He'll use lots of things, but that's his goal for your life. So am I stepping out of line when I say I think the reward that he's going to give us for prayer is not weed blossoms, and it's not just things that echo in eternity. I think the point, and I think evidence shows it, the point is that prayer makes us more like Jesus. And God's purpose in prayer, and the reason He wants us to pray, pray is one, so we can move His hand and affect our reality, but even more so, God is changing us through our prayers. We're going to Him in prayer, not just to get stuff done, but to get changed into the person God wants us to be. Does that make sense? And if that's true... If the reward at the bottom of the prayer cereal box is A, moving the hand of God, and B, being transformed, how do I pray so that I am maximizing the transformation in my life? Because honestly, if I'm just praying as a ritual and a routine, there is no wonder that it, oftentimes it is empty and meaningless and really hard to motivate. Anybody here ever have mo trouble motivating yourself to pray? Anybody ever, oh, I'm supposed to pray today. You ever said it that way? And, and maybe not out loud because you're with church people. I have to go spend some time alone with my Lord right now. And you're going, crap. Uh, how, do, how do I squeeze that into the schedule? How do I make that fit? 
Well, if I'm going into a room because it's a routine, a ritual, or a requirement of my life, then I'm going to do that. If I'm just checking off a box, but if I am going into a room because it is going to change my reality and change me as a person, then suddenly if I believe in that and doing that, my motivation goes a totally different direction, right? So how do I do it? Let's ask Jesus. That's a, that's a good cop-out answer, right? Let's just see what Jesus says. We just read a part of it a little bit ago. Matthew 6, verses 5 and 6. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that's all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. So, he says, if you want it to work, step one, get away from people. Two things happen because you're getting away from people. One is there's a measure of humility. Back in those days, you know how um, Muslims, they, they pray a certain t- number of times a day, and it's exactly at a certain time. They ring a bell, and everybody drops at that moment and does their prayer thing, right? You know how that, you've seen that, right? This is yes. Okay? Now, the Jews, I don't know if they still do, but in, in Jesus' day, they didn't have like you had to pray at 10, what they had was you need to say certain prayers certain numbers of times a day between, say, 8 and 10. You had a couple-hour window to get the prayer in. Now, if you didn't get it in, that was bad. But as long as you did it between 8 and 10, and if you could happen to be at the temple, that was cool, or the tabernacle, that was cool. But if not, wherever you were, if you could get in that prayer between 8 and 10, that was a good thing. So it didn't take some people long to figure out it how to rig the system because you want people to think highly of you so what you do is if you were really good at this stuff is you time it so that at 10 o'clock you weren't at the temple you were on a busy street corner and you'd be walking down the street corner and you'd you'd check however you check what time it is and go, oh my goodness, I've just about missed the 8 to 10 o'clock window for prayer. I need to pray right here. And you'd stop on the busy street corner, and you would announce your prayer publicly so everyone can hear it and go, wow, that person can pray. I was blessed just being in the room while they prayed. Wow, that just, ah! Oh. And they would pray in such a way that they would get max, they would time it so they'd get maximum attention, maximum publicity, maximum glory. Everybody would brag on him, and Jesus says, and if you do that, those pats on the back you got, those compliments, that's all you're getting out of prayer. So part of the reason for going away was for humility, but there was something more going on. Because has anybody here ever had trouble with not enough distractions in your life? Are you like looking, have you ever gone through a day and going, man, today I was just so focused all day long and nothing got in my way and nothing interfered and my thought life was just perfect all day long. I, I, just, I need to go find something to distract me. Anybody have that problem with no distractions? You mothers of small children, you understand what I'm talking about, right? What Jesus is saying is, if you're going to connect with God, you've got a problem or a challenge to start with, and that is you are a physical and spiritual being trying to commune with a spiritual God, and the physical will always be distracting you. It was ironic, the first first service, I was doing this, I've got my tablet up here, and I forgot to put it on airplane mode, and I forgot to turn the volume off. And Pastor Barry sits right there, and Pastor Barry, during the sermon, he'll take some of the things that I say, and he'll tweet them or Facebook post them. So every time I would say something remotely interesting, Barry would post it. And when Barry would post it, my, my tablet would go, ding! <laughs> yeah, fail. And we have sufficient distractions in life, right? Right? So what he's saying is in order for you to connect with God in the way you need to connect with God, you need to do your best to minimize the distractions, to find a way to come out of all the people and all the dinging and all the buzzing and all the notifications 
and find a way to where you are focused on God and God alone. Psalm 27, 8 says, my heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. And we all live in that tension. This is what Tom Wright said. I just, this is so accurate. At its lowest, prayer is shouting into a void on the off chance there may be someone out there listening. At its highest, prayer merges into love as the presence of God becomes so real that we pass beyond words and into a sense of His reality, generosity, delight, and grace. For most Christians, most of the time, it takes place somewhere in between those two extremes. There are times that I'm able to get rid of enough distractions and my time with God, my prayer time, is, is, is just a connection with God. And there are times when I'm just going through some motions and getting it done. And my goal is to try to always be working to be in the presence of God in a real way. So I'm setting aside the distractions. Because once we get the distractions as set aside as we can get them, and by the way, can I, can I just lay this out there for you? If your goal is to make that happen seven days a week, in our culture, you're probably going to fail. Can, I be, can we be really honest? I, you know, we're in church, we're going to be honest. If you're going to kick yourself because you only managed to pray five times this week, five real times where you actually connected with God, Matter of fact, what, what I, I heard a guy do this once, and I think it's a great idea. I define a win in my life. I pick a number and say, that's, that's the win, because life happens. And so my goal every week, my goal is seven, but I'm not going to kick myself. I'm going to say a win is five. A win is five. If I can manage to, to get you know, every dis, all, enough of the distractions away from me for long enough to spend an actual time in the presence of God five times a week, I write that down as a win. Matter of fact, as a staff, we get together, we have our staff meetings, and twice a month, we have Steve's five questions. And one of the questions was, is, did you win in your time with God this week? And that's five times. Not seven, five. Because, like I said, if you don't have enough distractions, just email me, and I'll set up something to give you some of mine. Okay? But if you're like most of us, Don't set yourself some goal you're going to fail because all you do is spend more time in the guilt zone because you're not getting it done seven days a week. And you spend your whole week kicking yourself because of Tuesday. Tuesday, I missed. Get it back on Wednesday, Thursday, ah, Friday. Got it? Saturday, something. Okay, five. If I fail a week, I'll win next week. Does that make sense? That was real practical, but you can use it. Okay? So, I've got myself into the situation where I'm letting myself be in his presence on a regular basis. And I know for some of you folks, some of you folks, you, you need to set a goal of two a week. Because you've never done it before, you've never succeeded. And if you set five, you're not going to make it. Whatever you're able to do now, just up it a little bit and make that your goal. Does that make sense? Grow, okay? Anyway, you're in his presence. Now comes the cool part for you're transformed by his power. Your Father who sees everything will reward you. See, let me, let me, let me see if I can phrase this in a way that you, you'll, you'll help with this. You need to have something that you are praying for that scares you. See, an awful lot of our time, our faith isn't growing in our prayer because we're not praying for anything that requires faith. Can we be honest? Most of the stuff we're praying for is going to happen anyway. One of the things, I, this is for, for you people who are newer Christians, I'm going to give you a, a little primer on how to, act, how to look like a mature Christian. If you're, if you're going somewhere, don't pray for a safe trip. That's newbie talk. You want to pray for traveling mercies. Because that's, that's the in lingo, but that's the buzz lingo. Okay, traveling mercies means I am with it as a Christian. I've got the whole thing down. I know all the lingo. I know the jargon. So I'm not praying for safe travel. I'm praying for traveling mercies. 
Uh, that was free and worth it. Now, here's the thing. We all, you know, and I, I believe in praying for all kinds of stuff. Pray anything that bothers you. And praying for a safe trip, that's cool. But honestly, I was coming back from upstate New York, from West Point, after visiting my grandkid. And I'm coming, and there was a guy traveling with me. I am almost certain he was not praying for safety. Not because he was driving recklessly, just, I don't know, the one finger salute, little things like that told me that he had not immersed himself with prayer that morning to make sure that he arrived safely at his destination. I'm out there traveling, you're out there traveling with hundreds and thousands of people, and most of them aren't praying, and they're getting there. Does that make sense? You're praying, okay, God, make sure that we have, our, as we see next week, our daily bread. Well, I've got a loaf at home now. I've got a food line half a mile from my house. i got enough in the checking account to buy some bread. Starving's not a problem for me. Now, you pray for those things, but we're praying for stuff that's going to happen anyway. You want to challenge? You want to grow? Pray for something stupid. Ask God, what's something stupid you want to bring into my life? And stupid in the case of, this just can't happen. Something that's beyond your belief. I, this was a few years ago, and I was struggling with, with, a, with a thing about, with me and God were having a struggle because that's how this works. And God wanted me to, te- wanted to teach me a certain lesson about himself. And he told me to pray for something. And I said, that's stupid. There is no way you will give me that. There is no way that's going to happen. See, here is the problem. God was asking me for something. He was wanting to give something to me that took this much faith. I had this much faith. Does that make sense? I mean, I have plenty of faith that when I was in downtown Philly and praying for a parking space, God could give me a parking space in downtown Philly. This was bigger than that. It was a lot bigger than that. And God said, I want you to pray for this. And I'm going, God, that's not, you don't do that kind of stuff in my life. You got anybody, anybody got that on them? There are things God does in other people's lives, but he doesn't do in your life. Anybody got one of those, that kind of stuff? This is the stuff, God, you only do that for the superstars. God, you only do that kind of stuff for, for the big names. I mean, no, those are the people that, you know, those are the ones that are, fa- no way, God, that you, you do that for the, for, the, or for the little old lady who's a prayer warrior who prays eight hours a day. That's who, you, you don't do that kind of stuff for me. Ah, faith. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. So if God wants me to grow, he needs to increase my faith. How do you increase your faith? By praying something that's bigger than your faith. Just like if I want to pick something up, if I want to pick up a heavy weight, let's say I'm working out and the coach says, I want, hey, pick that weight up, and you go, can't do that. Not possible. Pick it up. Did you not hear me say I can't do it? Did you miss the whole can't do it part? Pick it up. Walk over, nothing happens. Pick it up. Next day. Boom. Next day. Boom. Next day. Boom. Next day. 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 <gasps> Strength increased. The way God increases your faith in prayer a lot of times is by having you pray for something that you don't even believe is possible. And as you pray... As you consistently do that, God takes your faith and he brings it up to the level necessary. And that's what he was after. It's for you to increase your faith. Does that make sense? So I would encourage you, if you're a Christian and you're even remotely stuck in your prayer life, find something really silly and say, God, what do you want me to pray for that's stupid? God, give me something stupid to pray for. And watch what he does in your life. Okay? So, we're being transformed by his power. We'll talk some more about that next week, how that works. And then the, the last piece, be transformed by his, by his power, is to be eager for his response. Now, we read this earlier. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. Now, 
how do I keep praying for something over and over without repeating it? Well, the key is to be eager for God's response. See, in those days, they actually thought if they used magic words, God had to respond, or the God had to respond. But Jesus, he said, come into the room, the, the private room and pray. That room meant a treasure place. If you go into a treasure room, what do you expect to find in it? Not a tough question, is it? He says, go into the treasure room and ask for treasure. That's like going to 7-Eleven and asking for a Slurpee. They got those there. It's not surprising to walk into a 7-Eleven and find a Slurpee, is it? You know 7-Eleven? Okay? Now, it's surprising to walk into a Belk and get a Slurpee. All right? You're not going to expect it there. But you walk into a 7-Eleven, you're going to find Slurpee. He's saying, you're going into the place, you're going into the prayer room where I keep the treasures, and you're asking for treasure. Duh! You can count on it. You can expect it. You can be optimistic. You can pray expectantly like God's going to answer your prayer because he wants to. It's kind of like, you say, but, but what about, he says not to repeat, well, it's, it's empty repetition. I think what he wants you to pray like is like your kids pray the night before Disney World. Because what's your kid do the night before Disney World? They come to you and they say, we're going to Disney World tomorrow, right? You say, yes. And they say, great. And they run away and they come back. How long later? Yeah, two minutes, 14 seconds, something like that. We're going to Disney World tomorrow, right? Right. And they run away and they go, we're going to Disney. That's it. You're coming to God saying, you're going to do this, right? And you come back. And now it's not empty repetition. It's a worship thing. It's you coming to God saying, God, I know that you want to grant me these things. I know that, God, you're wanting to work in my life. You're wanting to change me. You're wanting to change my reality based on my, my prayers. So, God, I'm coming to you in the treasure room and asking you expectantly for treasure. Well, that's a little different than going into a room and going through the ritual, and God bless them, and God bless them, and God bless them. See the difference? And I'm doing it expectantly. See, when I realize that there is a God who listens to my prayers and wants to answer them, and there is a God who wants to use that prayer to train me, when I realize that prayer is more about God changing me than me changing God's mind, I could, it's not that hard to pray. And it doesn't matter where I am in my journey. Because wherever I am in my journey, God wants me to take one more step of faith. There are things that you may pray about if you've been a Christian for years and years and years that would be an incredible challenge to somebody who's been a Christian for an hour and a half. Some of you guys, when I said pray for something stupid, what popped into your head was, oh, I'd like to read my Bible and pray five times a week. I think that, and to, me, to you, that's scary. That's a scary prayer. God, make it so I can have time with you five times a week. I mean, Steve said to do that, but man, that's, that's scary. I don't know how I'm going to do it. i got kids. i got a job. i got a life. There's no way I can do that. There you go. Pray for that. For some of you, it's a lot bigger thing. Wherever you're at in your, in your journey, God's saying, okay, I want you to come into the treasure room and ask me for treasure. And let me change you as a process. So, a couple questions. Number one, do you pray as if God's really listening? Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. But if every time you pray, you can get into your brain that you are praying as if God is listening, as if the hand of God is going to move based on what you say in your prayer room, as if God's going to change your reality because of your words, it'll change your prayers. And do you come to prayer as a way for God to change you? Instead of just manipulating Him to get stuff you want? That'll change everything. Now, one really big piece is a thought that I, you should just stop and let this one amaze you every once in a while. We talked about it a little bit earlier. The God of the universe wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to, you to come to pray because he wants to spend time with you. Now, if that doesn't amaze you, you're not thinking right. You, you've gotten the whole Christian stuff in your head too strong, and you're not really thinking it through, because it should amaze you that God wants to spend time with you. The real God of the universe wants you in His presence. 
And if you don't have a relationship with God, it should really amaze you. Because you may have this picture of God as being the old man upstairs or the, you know, the big powerful guy with the beard, whatever your picture of God is. It should amaze you that the God of the universe wants a relationship with you, and he wants it so much that he sent his son to die to build that relationship. And if you'd like to talk to somebody about having that relationship with God, all we ask you to do at the end of the service is you grab one of these blue bags. We've got some in the corners of the platform. We've got some on those bookshelves. And if you grab one, here's what will happen. Somebody will come up to you who's been trained, and they'll say, can I unpack that with you? It'll take about 10 minutes. They'll walk you through the contents of the bag, and spoiler alert, in the end, they're going to teach you to pray. Not just any prayer, but a prayer that says, God, forgive me my sins, cleanse me, come into my life, and change me. Start the transformation that we were talking about today. If you're ready for that, just grab one of the blue bags. If you've already accepted Christ, we tell you every week, the next step is to be baptized, to make that next step of obedience, being baptized. We baptize the first Wednesday of every month. If you need to be baptized, let us know. We'll set it up. If during this thing there's something that came up and you want to pray about it, it might be very possible that when I say God wants you to pray about something stupid, something popped into your head. And for the rest of the time, you've been trying to talk God out of that. You didn't mean that. If you want to pray about that, we've got a cross over there. It's for praying about anything. You want to pray for a person. You want to pray for anything at all. We have the cross there in this next song. If you want to go over and pray, that's what that's there for. It's a place for you to pray. If you want someone to pray with you, we've got some people standing there who'd love to pray with you. Just approach one of them, say, would you pray with me? And they'll pray with you about whatever it is that's on your heart that you want to pray about. Um, If you want to take communion, we have communion stations in the back and one here in the front. And those are, if you want to just remember all that Christ did in your life. See, most of the time, when we read something in the Bible, like pray without ceasing, it flips the guilt switch in us. Because we look at it and say, A, we don't think we can do it, and B, with the way my prayer life is, I don't think I want to do it. But if we shift our mind to where Christ wants it to be, if we shift it to the realization that God wants us to come into the treasure room and ask Him to change the reality around us because that's the natural thing He wants to do, it changes how we pray. If we come into our prayer room, whatever, closet room, office, bedroom, bathroom, whatever it takes, and we're praying... God, change me. God, grow my faith. God, make me more like Jesus. It'll change everything. In other words, it'll change everything when you realize that prayer is more about God changing you than you changing God's mind. Would you stand with us?